on the Lawrence Landscape Architects. Um, she has worked on a tremendous amount of projects at various scales, ranging from master plans and reports on very de uh, detailed uh, different types of development. Um, curious about her, she started uh, around the fine arts, and she still does a tremendous amount on that in that regards. But she's currently working on the Atkins Place Park and Bayside Private Streets, many of them on the waterfront of Toronto. And, um, and she's a very strong voice for us on the panel. Welcome. Bruno Weber is an associate at KPMB, and uh, where he has worked on a number of competitions, and, and probably if you can think of any competition that has happened in the last couple of years, he's probably worked on it. Uh, he's also worked on a number of different academic buildings as an architect. But most recently, he spent a fair bit of time and was uh, with Ken awarded for the uh, J uh, Jack Layton Ferry Terminal. So we can look forward to seeing him with some of his work on the waterfront. Welcome. Ute Maria Giambattista. She has 15 years of experience. She's a member of the Ontario Professional Planning Institute as well as the Canadian Institute of Planners. Um, she's also the Vice Chair of the Ontario Chapter of the Congress of Neo Urbanism. Um, she's, uh, through her work, she's shown, shown a tremendous commitment to the integration of social, economic, and environmental sustainability factors. Um, she's practiced in Canada, the US, Russia, China, and this is just kind of <coughs> sprinkling a, a global presence, starting with the fact that her earlier degree is in Mexico City um, and then in Queen's University. So, probably those few spots that she hasn't kind of had a bit of a presence in. So, Ute, welcome. So, I, I know our uh, presenters were taking notes as each other one was, uh, was talking, so I'm sure they're going to have some uh, comments. But I'm going to ask our, our panelists um, who watch the presentations to provide a little bit of, of a reaction. And just for our audience, um, I know that you're all dying to have a mature conversation of this, so I'm hoping that we, uh, we don't have any heckling or oohs and ahs. Um, we're, we want to keep this uh, very focused, so please let's, let's keep this as a, as a mature conversation. Um, otherwise, I'll have to bring some of the language I use with my 9 and 12 year olds and try and keep everybody um, uh, focused. So to our, to our panel, I'll open it up a, a little bit um, for new members, and then we'll see um, Ken and Bob together. Of course, now they're silent. <laughs> Is it possible to move the slide yeah. projector? So yeah. That's I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, you know, uh, everyday lives. 
And when you do that, you, you do have to have uh, and, and make some hard decisions. And I don't think this is different from, it's nothing against airports. It, it will be something that we will be talking about. It's for some reason, suddenly we, we have to, uh, I don't know, use the silos again and go into a, that type of industry, for example. So uh, you do have to uh, take a step back and really think on, on what is uh, what type of waterfront you want to see in the future. And, and that's something that it's, it's very hard and sometimes requires making very hard decisions. I became a landscape architect probably for the same reason that most of you became architects, urban designers, planners. Um, just because I want to make Toronto a better place to live. And um, the way that I approach any design project is how to make a project better. I don't look at, well, it already works. I'm not making it worse. I have to make it better. So when I pose a question from a landscape architect view sustainably and environmentally, how will this runway, that new runway, impact the sustainable components of the design? Will there be more um, green space? I'm looking at the pictures right now, it's all just mm -hmm. kind of started for their, how, so th these, are, these are the issues that I would like to raise a bit more from a sustainable perspective. And the way that, the, the way that we're going to develop the design program. Right. Yeah. I would just like to take a moment to thank uh, both points of view this evening. Uh, extreme contrast, but uh, I think it is very healthy to get full understanding of both sides. Um, I come from an architectural background. I come from an architectural background where we're, as a company, KPMG, we're very interested in the public realm. And we, Toronto right now is, in my opinion, right at a tipping point where we're at that moment where we are gonna go into something that is great. Not just amazing, but great. Uh, we are finally gonna reach the world stage with our waterfront policies, our parks, our design vision for the future and our future developments. And I, I, it's, it's a very precarious tipping point. It can be just one single item that can shift that balance and that movement forwards towards this amazing project, amazing city. Um, we always have a tendency to compare ourselves to New York, and I, I think it's time to say enough. We are actually so amazing and by ourselves that we are starting to find our own voice within the world stage when it comes to design and urban planning and uh, the waterfront and all across the board various components. Thank you. Um, Ken, I'll ask you to respond a little bit to both the last presentation and the comments. Sure. Um, I think so far, we'll see how far we get. We, um, Bob Boos and I basically were talking past each other. Um, and I, I want to see if we can join the conversation. And I, I will say, that I think when, when I look at your first diagram, the one that had the current pattern of flights with the white dots and the additional pattern of flights with the red dots, which expanded to the West Coast, to the Caribbean, to a whole series of other destinations, and the numbers that we're hearing in terms of the increase in passengers and so on, it would be disingenuous to suggest that such an increase um, is entirely benign, that all of the issues from noise to marine exclusion zones to landside traffic and so on will not have a major, major impact on 
on the city. Um, that being said, the question is, where, where does the burden of proof lie here? And I, I think you said that some of the, you called um, some of the analysis that's being done by independent parties based on experiences with similar sites at airports around the world, amateurish. Well, the truth is, as I said, until Transport Canada rules on this, we won't know what the facts are. Um, it's not up to your consultants to decide at the end of the day where the marine inclusion zones are or what types of landing are permitted or at what levels or how how the pilots will access this, what the safety conditions are. And so in, in a way, I feel like the so-called environment assessment is actually premature until we are in possession of that information, until we know reliably what the operations of this airport at the levels that you're proposing would be, uh, I don't think it's fair to ask Toronto City Council to actually make a judgment. So I, I think we've got the cart before the horse. We have, a, as I said before, we have a proponent and we've hired very professional consultants to advocate your case in the best way possible, but that's not an environmental assessment. I think the environmental assessment would say, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Not how do we make the solution work, how do we accommodate the solution, but what is the problem we're trying to solve? And if the problem is connectivity, what are the alternatives, including increased use of Pearson Airport, um, more efficient use of the Union Pearson Express, um, use of other regional airports, and the undertaking, if, if this were like a true environmental assessment, there would typically be one version which is being studied, which is the base case, the status quo. There would be another version which is expansion. And there might be another version which is shut the airport down, shut this airport down in favor of other alternatives. <laughs> that's, and I, I think that's the missing dimension. There's kind of an assumption that this is going to be okay and it has to be accommodated somehow and yet we really don't have the information to understand what the impacts would be and I think that's putting us in a very awkward position and it's putting council in a very awkward position of asking them to make a decision on the faith that this somehow is all going to work. Thank you. Bob, I'm wondering. Well, thank you, Ken, and, and it's always good to have another perspective on things, but uh, just a couple of things that I'd like to just address right up front. Uh, uh, the opening picture, I've been flying since I was uh, a teenager. I've never seen that many airplanes in the air at any one time before as were depicted in your picture, even in, a, uh, even in an air show. The only other photo or the only other um, the only other graphic uh, illustration that even comes close to that is the one that was done by Jeffrey Roche back when David Miller was running for uh, mayor and they showed some 28 aircraft right up to uh, DC-10 size that were circling the island and attempting to land on that airport, all a fabrication and all meant to fear bunger. Let me just address one other uh, matter that you break, brought up because you, you've uh, dealt with quite a few uh, different issues, but uh, Maybe two things I'll, I'll try to deal with. And one, remember that all the design work and all the measurements that are to being taken are based on existing, very stringent, as a matter of fact, most stringent uh, noise restrictions anywhere in the world uh, set out in the tripartite agreement with the NDF uh, 25 noise contour. So we have said categorically, we're on record and we We'll stand by that if the aircraft itself doesn't meet that very strict noise limitation. We're going to tell Bombardier where to take their, where to take or shove their airplanes. So it's that simple with respect to the noise. With respect to the marine exclusion zone and whether or not Transport Canada will approve 
an airport that meets the, uh, the criteria that again we have set out, uh, that uh, any extension uh, into the water at each end of the main runway has to be contained within the existing boundaries of the airport. It won't stretch down and impede the, uh, the western uh, channel or come near uh, Ontario Place or impinge on the, uh, on the inner harbour because if it can't be contained within the existing uh, 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 boundary of the airport and if it does in any way materially affect the position of those marine inclusion zone buoys, again, we're not taking the airplanes. It's that simple. So the criteria that's been set out clearly, the design work is all being done on the basis uh, that uh, if you, they, they either have to be able to design a runway uh, extension that will fit those parameters and Bombardier have to produce an airplane that meet the performance guarantees that are set out in our conditional uh, uh, purchase agreement. And there's no deal. There's no, there's no risk here and there's no risk somehow that at the end of the day that uh, Transport Canada uh, will be faced with having to approve a runway that extends down to uh, the Humber River as some have suggested. Uh, or that it, it, it pinches on the, uh, the inner, uh, uh, inner boundary of the, uh, the, uh, the harbor. The one last thing I'll say, and I don't want to monopolize, but the one last thing I'll say uh, is that um, uh, remember anything you want to say about ACOM, uh, they were the choice of three independent parties who chose them as the right uh, environmental uh, consulting firm to do an independent environmental assessment. All three were in agreement, they chose that, and as a further uh, insurance, if you will, to, um, to make sure at the end of the day that whatever they produced was fair and square and reasonably done with all the parameters adhered to, They've actually gone to Waterfront Toronto, a great organization, and uh, Waterfront Toronto will in fact have another consulting firm that will do a peer review. They'll they'll uh, they'll uh, decide who that firm is, and I think they already have, and they'll do a peer review of the work that's been done by the environmental assessment firm. So anything you say there, again, it's you know with all due respect, it's just not credible. Thank you. Uh, we have Bob, we've heard you articulate a response around uh, the, the aspects of noise, uh, aspects of the um, water exclusion zone, aspects of that building height, um, but you haven't addressed the question of traffic. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to uh, talk about traffic. The thing that I hear from those who would be opposed to any expansion, and fr frankly, most of those same opponents are opposed to the airport itself, is that somehow we're going to end up with a huge international airport. Think about that for a moment. You've got a little over 200 acres. The property that's been put aside for Pickering is 12,000 acres. The typical airport is in the five or 6,000 acre size. Ottawa is more than 4,000 acres. So when you compare that against 230 acres, they already have a major limitation in place. One more point, this NEF 25 noise contour is ultimately the real restriction in terms of how many slots will be given up, or given out, and how many uh, flights in and out of that airport will occur. And it is, uh, I mean, they're talking about maybe uh, 20, return, 20 additional return flights. Last but not least, you do have, amongst other things, a single runway today that's around 4,000 feet, in which will, under our proposal, and we're the proponent, uh, TPA or Port Toronto, as they're now called, are not the proponent they are in fact the airport operators, so they're one of three members of the tripartite agreement. But we are the proponent, and under our proposal, that runway extension that would involve 200 meters into the water at each end of the main runway, still gives you a relatively short runway, and it's a single runway. Think of even Ottawa with its three main runways, 
take a Pearson with the number of runways they have, and you get a perspective that's a little more in line with reality. And when it comes to large, it's all relative. If you were in, in if you were in Chicago, you would consider Midway Airport to be a puny little airport. That's where we operate into. O'Hare, in comparison, has over 70 million passengers annually. Midway, that puny little airport that we operate into, and that is entirely surrounded by residential areas, has a little over 20 million passengers. Now, 20 million is about a half of what Pearson has. If you're up into the, uh, the O'Hare's and the uh, uh, Tokyo's and uh, you know airports around the world that are of any size, including uh, Heathrow, then you are looking at airports that are in excess of uh, 70 million if they're in the top five, with Atlanta still leading the pack today uh, with uh, well uh, north of, uh, of 70 uh, in terms of the annual passengers. So it depends on your perspective. Ottawa has four and a half, roughly. Billy Bishop today has uh, roughly uh, three, uh, sorry, 2.4 um, uh, that go in and out of that airport. Uh, you know, it, it, again, you have to really put it in perspective, but there is no other airport that I'm aware of anywhere in the world that has those three main impediments that are natural barriers and prohibit, uh, pro and, and significantly prohibit any growth at that airport. Single runway, short, extremely noise sensitive area, most stringent noise restriction of any airport in the world, and last but not least, a critical land mass of about 220 acres or thereabouts, peanuts. That airport's never going to be a big airport. And uh, by any measure, it's a speck in terms of world airports, Pearson, O'Hare, and even that little puny airport that we fly into at Ottawa, or not Ottawa, but Chicago called Midway that has 20 million uh, passengers and is considered minor, it is, uh, the island airport is small compared to that. Thank you. Um, I will open it up to see if there's any questions coming from, from the floor. So I see two, two here back there. I want to ask that you first introduce yourself. Um, if you're addressing the question, uh, address it to one of the panel members or if it's to all of them. Uh, and if you can keep your questions brief and to the point, uh, better it will give us more chance to ask more more questions and, a re and as a reminder the, uh, the topic today is about design and it's about the, the, the physical form and the character of what we're building around so please yes hi my name is Jim Panu I'm a resident in the neighborhood uh, so I'd like to speak to a couple of design issues because uh, both Ken uh, and Mr. Deleuze uh, uh, spoke about the port lands and flight paths uh, now, uh, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, under the new TP312 standards, uh, version 5 of Transport Canada has, there's something called the takeoff surface. It's a protective, uh, invisible, sh basically, sheet of airspace that goes from the airport out over into the port lands. And by the time it hits the port lands, it's about 73 meters, uh, the, the takeoff surface. Uh, under FAA rules, uh, there's a substantially lower. It's about, uh, you know, it's about, uh, about 40, 50 some odd meters. Uh, but by the time it hits the port lands. So how do you propose to get around that? And then I have a second question that I'd like to follow up with after that, if that's okay. Yeah, do you want to ask the second question? Sure, uh, okay, the second question. Um, uh, back uh, in uh, 2012, uh, there, there's some condos that are being built over there, that are being finished over there, really quite tall. So I believe it was a lawyer from them that wrote Transport Canada and asked them uh, if a, uh, a safety review had been conducted at this airport given all the development that happened along here. Uh, about the same time, Porter submitted an instrument approach procedure coming in from the west, which uh, would be used in the event of fog, you know, under inclement conditions. Uh, and that particular procedure was approved by Transport Canada. It was allowed to be in place uh, for six months until Transport Canada started to look at it. When they looked at it, they found, again, in that particular one, there has to be a certain amount of 
clear optical free space. Uh, but they found a lot of the buildings over there were kind of uh, in the way. Uh, Transport Canada suspended that approach on March 4th, 2013. They revoked it on March 28th. 13 days later, Porter Plans was announced. Can I ask why you didn't tell the city uh, that this was the case, that this stuff was going on in the background. Now, uh, if you want to uh, challenge any of that, I've got the Transport Canada access to information documents over here. This is only about 400 pages of several thousand that, I, that I'm in possession of. Okay. And both questions addressed to Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. Uh, well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I don't know whether you're going to have an aviation say uh, that uh, uh, two things, I guess. Uh, firstly, I'll address the, uh, the approval of the LPV approach uh, onto rear weight. Uh, so uh, from the west to the, uh, uh, toward the east. There was an approach uh, approved. It was done by Transport Canada. Um, and it, it was in place for a certain period of time. Um, they determined that some other things should be looked at, particularly given the development of additional buildings along the waterfront. So they did suspend the approach. They never revoked the approach at any time. So it was never uh, revoked from the point of view. It was never unlisted. Uh, and, uh, and that approach, by the way, uh, was subsequently reviewed, approved, and has been back in place now for a considerable period of time uh, and have been, the flights are being conducted safely uh, throughout the time period that the approach was there. And uh, of course, uh, since it, it, uh, the approach has been back in place. So um, the, uh, the next thing I would say uh, is that um, um, when it comes to assessing uh, airports uh, and approaches, that is a Transport Canada prerogative. There are very detailed uh, uh, standards that are in place that set out what you can and can't do. Um, and uh, when it comes to designing any approach or any airport or any runway, they all must comply. And it's Transport Canada's job at the end of the day to decide whether we, we or the airport meet the criteria or not. And uh, we have a good track record. Uh, safety is our number one consideration. It always will be, uh, and um, that's something we stress on a day in, day out basis. Uh, uh, that's number one priority. So nothing changes in that regard. It was that first question about the, uh, the, the takeoff surface, TPC 12, version 5. Uh, how do you propose to get around uh, the fact that that fans out, reaches out into most of the port lands at a very low, uh, at a very low altitude? I don't think you actually have your facts right on that. Um, why would you think that we would uh, endeavor to buy aircraft that have a list price in excess of $60 million each uh, to not be able to put in place approved uh, approaches? Do you think that we are absolutely out of our minds or that we have that kind of those sort of dollars to risk? Obviously, your background uh, in this subject is probably uh, inadequate for making a determination as far as whether uh, something is approved or not. I would suggest that's not your prerogative. Read TP312 version 5, when it talks about safety purposes. I'm very familiar me, with the, uh, let with let the finish, document. Please. It's very specific in terms of what it dictates and that the influence that the airport has on land beyond the airport. And that's why it's important to every architect in this room. On that, and uh, see, the difficulty is not with the approach in. The difficulty usually is with the uh, missed approach in. It's typically with a lot of uh, 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 different uh, uh, instrumentation today on your on your missed approach. Um, you must allow a wider fan and a, uh, a greater clearance area on that missed approach, and it's all set out there. So um, um, the the increased use now of, um, of uh, RNP approaches um, allows way more
want precision. West Kidder are using them extensively in some of the uh, high density terrains out west are the ones that have, uh, you know, mountains and hills and other things. And uh, the equipment that we're, uh, we're, we're purchasing actually has RMP capability. And if we are successful in getting the, uh, the CS100s in place, we also plan to retrofit our Q400s so that in the future, developers actually will have more latitude in terms of what they can do along the waterfront without uh, being constrained by uh, misappropriation. Speak to the takeoff surface, which I, which I asked. So about. I'll, I'll pass the microphone. Uh, I also didn't think I'd have to do this, but I'll ask that the conversation be single on both sides. Uh, the next question is in the, just in the back. Gentlemen, with your hand up. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Bill Trimmer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I've been involved in this issue, I'm afraid, for a long time. Bef before Mr. Deleuze, actually, uh, I've been opposed to the island airport. And, and, but I'd like to hear, about, hear from the planners on this issue because uh, it's really great to have architects and planners uh, in the room here. It seems to me, and I'm not a planner, it seems to me that uh, this airport violates one of the principal... Uh, one of the principles of planning, and that is separation between industry and residential. And uh, airports, by definition, are an industrial use. And I can tell you, I, know, I don't live in the Bathurst Key neighborhood, but the people here are suffering very much from the noise, the pollution. We hear uh, stories about, about the pollution. Uh, I might also say this has been an issue that has gone on since the building of this airport. This issue from the very beginning was, is an airport compatible with a, the city? Now we have this entire redevelopment uh, along the waterfront, and I think Ken Greenberg really emphasized that. It is a threat. It is a threat. There, you, you know, people can, so this is my question, that essentially, what we have is, is two airports, two now major airports in the city. We have Pearson. We, uh, we, we, one of the justifications uh, I know that uh, the Port Authority gave, and uh, I, I don't know, Mr. Deleuze, whether you said this or not, but an advantage to the island airport was its access to the downtown, which could give the business community particularly good access to, the, to an airport. Today, within a matter of weeks, the, uh, the uh, Union Pearson Express is going to be opening, and uh, we have an airport in Pearson that has plenty of capabilities. This airport violates very serious planning issues here. Why would we continue to support it? This, uh, the one, one other thing, two, there, the airport, to be precise, is 215 <coughs> acres. This would be a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful opportunity for the extension of the, of, the, of the island park, for some development. I mean, who knows? It would be a wonderful debate to have what we could use for this land if the airport was closed. So I'd like to hear from the planners on So on the, the two planners, planners we have, Peter and Ken, um, can you speak to the incompatibility of land uses? As an island planner, I can tell you for me, it's all a question of scale. Um, the area is already uh, on the screen, as Reverend Ted said, and as you can see, I believe. Um, everybody wants a piece, wants a piece of, of the lake, including the airport, but, but we as urban planners have to really balance the needs of everybody. And once I get plans, uh, finalized plans, to um, wait and prioritize the type of waterfront and the type of vision we want to have to for the city. Uh, we are very interested in, in making this a pedestrian-friendly uh, a, a resource for the entire city. Uh, we have to balance everybody's needs. And um, it's already at that site, so um, it's something that we, we will have to um, um, make a decision on, but I think from the urban design perspective, the priority, number one priority, which at the end, it also benefits whether it's an airport that does a 
business or any other sort of business is having a, a veteran friendly um, um, neighborhood with incredible high quality publicly owned. Everybody can benefit from that. And, and if we have to bring an absurd on our business that so readily pays, we really have to be very careful and not to, to um, balance all the efforts, all the, all the money we're putting into creating this vision. <coughs> I'm going to echo uh, much of what you just said. I, I think the key is balance and scale. And at a certain scale, we all talk about mixed use, and mixed use is great. And when things are in rough balance and in equilibrium, um, that mix can be positive, it can be synergistic, it can be stimulating. I think what is proposed here this is the reason why Anne Golden, who comes at this from an economic standpoint, Bill Cameron, well known to all of you as a prominent architect, Paul Bedford, former chief planner, David Crombie, who was the originator of the Water Company Generation Trust, all of us perceive that the change in scale, and I, I think uh, Robert Teresa's numbers were really interesting when he was comparing the size of Ottawa Airport and the number of passengers, and you see the vast, you see what's being squeezed into this very, very small site, and you see the impacts. And so if you look at what's happening out on Bathurst Street, right beside this school, right beside the basketball court and the playground, and you look at Little Norway Park, and then you imagine a more than doubling of the number of passengers the land side problem, and for the life of me, I don't know how you solve the intersection of Lakeshore, Bathurst, and Fleet Street. There is no way to bring a separate, you know, with all the struggling we're having over public transit, there is not going to be some magic solution that will extend the subway over here, or bring, we already have a light rail line on Queen's Key, we're not gonna create a new light rail line. And by the way, when colleagues describes this currently as a briefcase airport. But when it goes from a briefcase airport to a suitcase airport where people are taking charters to the Caribbean and Las Vegas and California and Florida, it's an entirely different thing. Those people are not coming on bicycle or walking. They're coming in some wheeled vehicle. Uh, so it, there, is, there is that issue of strain. And I think another thing we have to think about is what is the opportunity cost? In other words, if you were to do this, what are you giving up? And what you're giving up, and this was the same argument we had about the Mega Casino Resort, and the same argument we had about Doug Ford's proposal to put a mall and, uh, and the whole array of things he wanted to put in the Portlands. You are giving up something which money can't buy, which is this extraordinary, connected, green, accessible waterfront from an economic standpoint, in terms of job creation, in terms of value for the city, in terms of why people would come here, why they would live here, why they would start businesses here, you would be severely compromising an asset, which is irreplaceable. And I think that's really the question that you have to ask. Thank you. Um, back there in black. Hi, I have a question for all of the panelists. I'd be curious about your response. Um, sorry, Elsa Lamb, editor of the Canadian Architect Magazine. Um, I'm curious about some of the, um, the projects that are in the pipeline and about to open and what the, their effects would be on uh, the current and the proposed expanded airport. In your view, um, I'm thinking about the, the pedestrian tunnel to the airport, um, as well as the expanded uh, Queen's Key Boulevard, and I guess the other obvious one on the table would be the Union Station Express. Um, so how would those affect from an architecture design uh, perspective, um, the access to the proposed airport um, and uh, the proposed expanded airport? So let's try and just do this a bit of rapid fire uh, so that everybody can get a chance and we'll just start from the center. 
Okay, so one screen P is uh, tidied up in preparation for Pan Am Games or shortly thereafter. Uh, obviously, the flow of traffic is going to be immensely better. It's been chaotic for the last two years. Everybody would be probably admitting of that. Uh, bottom end of Bathurst Street been under some pressure with, uh, amongst other things, construction associated with the tunnel. <coughs> Tunnels uh, within 60 days of being completed. The other thing about the tunnel, of course, is that uh, it'll uh, it'll take the uh, lumpiness out of the traffic, so you won't get those big surges of 200 passengers at a time. It'll be a much steadier flow. Uh, I think maybe I can. Uh, there was one other question there, and I'm forgetting what that was. So the pedestrian link itself uh, is opening within 60 days. Obviously, going to have a profound effect, not only in terms of providing better access to passengers. But again, getting rid of that lumpiness, those surges of traffic that have been there for some time that are associated with a couple hundred people at a time coming across on a ferry and then nothing for 30 or for 50 minutes and then another 200, etc. It'd be a much steadier flow of traffic and that should have a profoundly and important uh, moderating effect on the airport and on the surrounding area. Um, I, I see the redevelopment of each case and that's a huge, huge opportunity to unlock not only uh, residential areas, but a lot of uh, business opportunities, tourism. And um, there's a, a large amount of uh, investment that the city has put in place. I, I think it's all good, but uh, we do have to be careful on balancing everybody's needs. Okay. Yeah, I'll just sort of comment on couple of things you mentioned. I think we have this funny habit in Toronto of sucking and blowing at the same time. So two examples, two examples of that are we've gone to enormous pains through an international competition to reduce vehicular traffic on Queen's Street and bring it into Greenwood and create the connection that will provide a key missing link to the Mountain Greenwood Trail, which extends now all the way through the 50 kilometers of Plow and all the way out to Port Credit and Mississauga and beyond. And this is a key point. And so to do that and at the same time introduce all this new traffic right at this point is clearly a conflict. The second conflict is we've spent all this money and all this effort to get the Union Pearson Express, which is solving the problem mm -hmm. for the business travelers who are right downtown in Toronto in a very convenient and accessible short headways to Pearson Airport, if, if that's what you require. So again, why we're doing that at the same time we expand this airport for those very same travelers is a mystery to me. Okay, Donna? Uh, that would be continuing to echo Sam's um, comments about when we think of the waterfront, it's not just right here. The waterfront goes all the way from Humber Beach to the beach here. So the, the connection is really important.
expensive traffic to, to the airport. I mean, it's, it's hard to argue about the increase. We all know it will happen. Uh, yes, it will be smoothed with the, the roughness of the economy, with the waves. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that there is going to be a tremendous amount of more cars coming through the area, sitting, idling. It doesn't change. hear about your business plan in case we get a jet approval. Um, and also, who is to pay for the enormously costly tunnel and rebuilding of the uh, we're, runway? We're, we're trying to keep the conversation focused around as much of design and planning. Oh, okay. is, there, is there an implication in, in terms of what you're asking? No, we're trying we don't to want to get into, into funding. Well, I was just wondering how viable so I'll, I'll invite yeah. you to, to approach Bob right after the conversation. Okay, I'm sorry. sure he will okay. want to be part of this, but let's try and keep it to uh, aspects of design and planning. So gentlemen with the, uh, for, for yeah, yourself, with exactly. It's a legacy issue. We have spent so much time and money trying to undo all the industrial uh, devastation that happened before and recreate a waterfront. Why are we putting so much time and effort and money to bring in an industrial use that is much more damaging in terms of its function? The third one, for example, to illustrate this further, is at the moment to service the fuel for the existing fleet there are, Mr. Deleuze will know the numbers, but there are about eight trucks, eight double tankers that we go on the ferry, and the passengers, the ports passengers, travel on the top on the same ferry. When the jets come, if they do, and it's increased traffic, how, what is this going to do to the impact of fueling the state, the operations of the airport? Are we going to build large uh, fuel farms if they can't go underground, and what happens in the case of accidents. The issue of emergency response is very important. Both the immediate first responders, and then how do you get people out onto the mainland, etc. These are very fundamental things, because the airport is not five miles out of town, it's on our doorstep. Who, and we'd like to hear the discussion. Who do you want to address the question to? I think Mr. Deleuze is the obvious one, because he knows what the answer is. To send everybody out might not be functional. Thank you. Uh, let me let me try to address that if I can. Then uh, um, first, firstly, I think uh, the uh, the fuel issue. Let me just start with that one. There are about uh, four or five trucks a day that actually come across with fuel, and 
uh, the anticipated additional uh, number of trucks are somewhere uh, in the one to one and a half additional trucks a day until somewhere in that, uh, that area. But um, so it's not a substantial change. And remember that those trucks are actually are over the space of a, about a 16 uh, plus hour time period. And uh, right from early morning until quite late at night. And, um, but generally we try to avoid the, uh, the trucks themselves and the deliverers try to avoid the busy times during the day. Um, I think your, uh, the, the second part of that question uh, related to, um, and just, just help me here with the. Uh, The, um, you know, I think, uh, again, I said about what the limitations are at the airport, uh, and uh, uh, doing an airport uh, with, uh, with some expansion, uh, including the, uh, the uh, additional couple hundred meters into the water at each end of the uh, runway adds, uh, in our estimation, somewhere north of 40 uh, slots or 20 return flights. You have to remember as well that these aircraft are actually designed not for short range Ottawa, Montreal, New York, sort of back and forth every hour, but they're actually designed to go out there four and five hours. So a CS-100 going to Vancouver might actually only do one takeoff and one landing uh, at Billy Bishop in any given day. Uh, so that's much different than a fleet of 26 Q400s that typically go back and forth all day long uh, to destinations of, that are about one hour away. And uh, so when you're looking at this, you need to think a little bit about the sort of destinations that we're proposing to uh, provide service to, uh, which actually um, require a lot less uh, use of the airport from the point of view of takeoff and landing for movement. That's why with a very few number of uh, additional slots, we can actually uh, do a fair number of flights in terms of at least distance and, and destinations that we've covered. The one other thing I'd just like to say, and I think it's a bit relevant here, is you need to keep in perspective that when, in 1967, when I first took lessons at that airport, uh, the traffic in and out of that airport, in terms of total movement, was about double what it is today. So progressively over time, the number of actual flight movements has gone down, and the number of uh, the types of aircraft that are now using the airport versus what was used in earlier days. Somebody made reference to the fact that I personally have an airport and an airplane that I keep at the airport. They're right in making that statement. That is correct. That four-place uh, aircraft, which is typical of the types of aircraft that are accommodated at that, that airport uh, by private users, uh, is an airplane that is about 10 times noisier than the 74-seat Q400. So you need to sort of think about uh, about the noise and the size and the uh, and the actual number of flights when you're actually looking at this issue. I'm going to try and um, squeeze a couple of extra questions, so we'll try and be fast um, up here in, in the back, and then we'll go to, to that side, please. Okay, um, just one observation first uh, about the tunnel and the benefits. I think they've been overstated. I know that um, I know that the, the tunnel will smooth the flow of passengers, but the surge is really um, that it will be smoothing are at the check-in desk on the island side and at the taxiway uh, pickup on the city side, it will do nothing to improve flow through the neighborhood. Um, but this is a, a debate that's been going on now for a couple of years. And Mr. DeLuce's presentation covered the things that I've heard before, his noise, uh, the planes being quiet, uh, choice for customers, convenience for customers, um, promoting Toronto abroad, and assisting development. Um, but in the two years since then, we've heard many new things um, concerning health issues, misapproach surfaces, safety and emergency response, jet blast. Um, this March, we heard numbers of passengers twice what we were hearing up to this point. 
all of the city's planning studies are premised on totally different numbers. Um, the Union Pearson Express comes into place. We now see models of the noise barriers and so on. Anyway, going on and on, but my question for Mr. DeLuce is, have you got anything new to offer the city since your presentation two years ago? Thank you. And you're going to introduce yourself again? I'm the voter. I say I'll be matching up. <coughs> I think the new thing is uh, the tunnel opening in the 60 days, the next 60 days, that's going to have a profound effect. I think the uh, technology being offered under the CS100 aircraft program is absolutely phenomenal and will be game changing. Uh, additionally, um, the, uh, we haven't made a lot of uh, comment about this, but there's already a couple uh, billion dollars of economic uh, development coming to the city as a result of the airport. Uh, there's estimated to be another uh, um, thousand jobs at Porter alone and a couple thousand in the area generally, plus another $250 million of economic benefit that will accrue to the city as a result of uh, what we're talking about here. Those are pretty profound uh, numbers and six significant changes. I think it's really, uh, uh, there were a lot of the same sort of concerns before we started the Q400 operation. None of it's proven to be true. And uh, it's our contention that what we're proposing here with the CS100s uh, will be equally beneficial to the city and to those who uh, travel and those who work and play and reside in the uh, in the in the general area. So that's what I'll say by way of a comment. I, I, I just want to address one thing that I probably failed to address earlier, and that's our view on UP or UP Express, as I heard them refer to it a couple of days ago. I didn't realize it was called UP. Union Pearson Express, we are very much in favor of that service. But remember, even when it's fully deployed and being used to full potential, it's still going to move less than 5% of the passengers who actually go to and from Pearson. And 98% uh, uh, of those who travel in and that airport will, in fact, continue to use cars. On our part, remember that what we're doing now is actually taking a significant amount of traffic off the Gardner and the uh, and the Lakeshore and the uh, and also the 427. We're reducing actual passenger kilometers by some 20 million uh, plus a year, which is significant and, and is in itself a reduction in environmental impact. Thank you. Uh, we had a question back there. Yes. Bob Rasmussen, I'm uh, president of the Waterfront, and I think that Mr. DeLuce's comments just lead perfectly into my question. I've been disappointed with um, much of the discussion during this evening. I came because I was interested in design considerations, and what I got was basically a commercial for flying planes to other countries. That's not what I came to hear. So I'd like to talk about design considerations. And Mr. Deleuze just told us he was so proud that he's taken millions of cars off the expressway and he's moved them into this residential area. <laughs> now, as from a design consideration point of view, we have a community center, we have a school, we have a park, we have homes, we have a music garden. This is a residential community school environment. How, from a design point of view, do you pump this basically the same amount of traffic as going into Ottawa down one residential street? We're talking about changing a residential street, or we have been changing, but we're going to double it, into an access to the Ottawa airport. From a design point of view, could you comment? From a design point of view, I mean, it's, it's a grand exercise. Uh, 
Sorry. Uh, from a design point of view, it's very difficult to answer your question properly, but it is next to impossible. Let's be, let's be frank here. Uh, we have tried so hard uh, within the city to change this waterfront to a more pedestrian friendly and a uh, transport oriented, TTC oriented approach to this neighborhood. In cars, and no matter how you scoot the cat, it's not going to change. It's going to get worse. Uh, there is an intense uh, increase, and to be frank, I, I personally do not see a solution that would uh, change this neighborhood to anything as an improvement. I mean, uh, what are you going to do in, in Europe? Like, I'm of Swiss descent. Switzerland, you dig tunnels everywhere <laughs> and you bury it or you create shelters to from highways from the surrounding neighborhoods and that's just not going to happen here. Yes, I am just adding. I will say I'm counting on this by Mr. Schneider as well that we can see in the past we have mentioned about uh, complementary retrofitting and um, that's what I hope that we can do that today. What kind of waterfront do we want to remember? What kind of retrofitting As, as designers, we always like to think we can solve the hard problems by coming up with clever solutions. But in this case, the question that you've raised, which is what happens on the land side and how do you get to it with those numbers of people, I'm afraid is insoluble. And what it reveals is the fundamental incompatibility. And there's an even more difficult part of that, which is even if there were a solution, the city would be stuck with a bill. So how, given all the other requirements we have for changing mobility in the city, how this would rise to the top is a profound question. And for that reason, I just, this is gonna be my final word, I just wanna point out that Waterfront Toronto, with a board representing three levels of government, has come out and said, this is a bad idea. This shouldn't happen. This is an agency that deeply involved in development, in economic development on the waterfront, which sees this as damaging and incompatible. And th that should give us some pause. Thank you. I actually was going to close with that, with that um, little um, sentence in the sense that, you know, we have an airport here on the at an airport that serves basically the downtown. It's a suitcase um, airport. But basically, it's, it's being serviced through a residential cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. And the design, urban design challenges that that present cannot be overestimated. And, 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 and I really don't see any other um, Solution, uh, you know, introducing the, the streetcar, but but it's just the location, it's how you approach, how you enter the the, the, the actual building or, or the grounds of the airport. That the current sensation, the current layout, doesn't allow you for for very much and more than what it is as it is. It's already uh, taxing the whole system. So it's it's just maybe an unfortunate way of things happening, but you cannot expect to have a, a larger than what it is airport service through a residential cul-de-sac. I haven't been able to solve that question. Thank you. Paul? Yes, thank you. Um, over 113 years ago, uh, changes. 
things that uh, you never would have imagined before. I've also had the good fortune, you know, more recently to have uh, a good look at some of the uh, ideas that are being put forward on the community precinct plan. And some of those are quite visionary, uh, quite frankly, and that uh, with or without an airport, I think there are things that will enhance and improve the waterfront. Um, and that Malkin site and the everything surrounding that definitely needs to be dealt with at some point in time. I know that in Best Toronto, I'm sorry, I know that uh, Build Toronto uh, and, and a good number of developers uh, have in fact employed a lot of talent in terms of looking at what could be. I've also had the good fortune of actually looking at some of those visionary uh, drawings and, uh, and solutions uh, that I think at least have some merit and uh, could potentially solve the access uh, issues, could add more green space, uh, could at the same time uh, produce some other mixed use that would be complementary to the waterfront and, and, and as well would reduce conge congestion. I'll just close and just say one last thing and that's that, uh, 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 I'll just close and say one last thing and that's that uh, uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, what, what, is, uh, what has gone on over the last period of time has definitely uh, uh, changed things immensely and the fact that we're now having some 2.4 million passengers actually using the uh, airport in harmony with the rest of the waterfront is pretty profound. The, um, the, uh, the fact that Waterfront Toronto continues to have jurisdiction over the majority of the property along the waterfront and will continue to do so uh, is pretty uh, significant in itself. They will decide what next uses are there and I think they can be pretty creative as they've demonstrated in the past. So clearly this is a conversation that could carry on for a significant amount of time. Our objective today was in fact not to solve the conversation, but rather to inform the conversation. I think everyone here has, now has you know, an additional pieces of information that you can think about. Um, there's a series of avenues that you can become active around, that you can become part of more conversation, more process. Um, certainly um, there's a political aspect of it, Council will be debating this. You can be part of part of that conversation. We hope that we have um, we've helped think it through and, and for you to be part of that. I'm sure that all our panelists would uh, linger after today if you want to approach them and ask them any, any further questions. But I do want to appreciate, you know, recognize and appreciate the level of candor um, and passion that everybody has brought into this conversation. Um, I think there are clearly opposing points of view, but everybody is putting on the table, and I, and I really appreciate that. So please um, join me in thanking our panelists. And we'll see you at the next TSA event.